This is Queer We Are. Welcome to Queer We Are, where each week I have conversations with some of the most interesting LGBTQ guests who will lift your spirits through their stories of good works they do or challenges they overcame or how they keep a positive attitude. And some even do all of the above. If you need a feel good show to keep your hopes alive or to help you get it back, then you're in the right place. My guest today, Del Shores, showed me LGBTQ movies in a whole new, big, bright, and beautiful light. Before I came out, I would search for any gay movie I could relate to. But most LGBT movies were depressing. Too much self-loathing, and later they all dealt with AIDS. Both are very important subjects, but come on, every film? There are films from the 70s that some consider classics, and out of fear of getting nasty emails, I won't name names, but I'm sorry, I hate almost all of them. Then, 1982's Making Love came out with Harry Hamlin, Michael Unkin, and Kate Jackson, and it blew me away. It was my senior year in high school, and I watched it more times than I can count. I watched it recently, and the production is not as good as I remember, but that doesn't change how it impacted me. And like earlier films, there was still a lot of angst. Things did get better in the mid-1990s. Now, now, the actors were usually straight, which is okay, but maybe a gay guy now and then. Also, they were fun and humorous, but they didn't connect with me as far as my identity. One of my all-time favorites, The Birdcage, <laughs> has as many great one-liners as Still Magnolias, and Robin Williams and Nathan Lane were superb together. Now, granted, I said the actors were usually straight. This was a few years before Nathan Lane did come out. As much as I loved The Birdcage, I had an inability to relate on a deeper level. Then there was 1998. Not only was it the year I came out, we also got the movie Trick. Yeah, it was straight guys again, but it was groundbreaking. It realistically showed gay men like I knew, but it wasn't a gay movie for a lack of a better term. By that, I mean it was simply a delicious rom-com with no other agenda. Now, I thought with Trick we had reached the pinnacle when the very next year, oh my God, Del Short's hysterical Sorted Lives released. Much different and over the top than Trick, but what awesome characters. And those characters that were gay, like Leslie Jordan's brother boy, they were hysterical. And what made Sorted Lives incredible is the gay characters were funny as hell. But unlike in the past, they were funny and gay and not funny because they were gay. It's a movie I never get tired of watching. Dell and I discuss Sorted Lives. We discuss his other films. We discuss his relationship with the great Leslie Jordan. And we also discuss Dell's foundation, which is doing wonderful things for new artists. So hang on. I'm your host, Brad Shreve. And as I said, my guest is Dell Shores, and stay right where you are to hear this incredible man, because queer we are. Dell Shores, I want to thank you for being with me today. It is greatly appreciated, and I'm very honored. Well, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Well, I'm going to start out the gate where I think a lot of people would expect me to, and I want to talk about probably your best-known production, which is Sorted Lives. And I also want to talk about Southern Baptist Sisters because I want to compare the two. Now, I'm sure, believe it or not, there are some people that aren't familiar with Sorted Lives. So can you just give a brief synopsis of that film? Oh, well, I love to write the aftermath of a big event. And so I chose the death of this good Christian woman, Peggy Ingram, has tripped over her lover's prosthetic legs in a seedy motel room and her one daughter's trying to cover it up and the other one is acknowledging what happened to mama and her needs and it's a lot of eccentric southerners and meanwhile the gay grandson is in los angeles deciding whether he should come home to his family and come out and then 
the institutionalized brother boy played by the amazing Leslie Jordan is being dehomosexualized at the same time. So it's a little bit whacked. <laughs> and so at the end, they all come together. It started, you know, this journey has been a long journey. It started in 96. It was uh, my coming out play. And then I adapted it to screenplay. We shot it in 99. It opened in film festivals in 2000. And then went to theaters in 2001. The DVD came out in 2003 and the crazy cult phenomenon happened because of it running 96 weeks in Palm Springs. So then it spawned a series at Logo in 2008 or nine, I think. And then the, the sequel, which is the final chapter of Very Sorted Wedding, came out in 2017. So there you, you're all caught up. There we go. 96 weeks in Palm Springs, that's impressive. It was crazy. A lot of people in the play followed you into the movie. Am I right? That's right. That's right. I drugged them into it. Uh, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> well, I ask because I noticed you tend to use the same individuals. I do. In your plays and in your movies. Now, are they reaching out to you? Are you reaching out to them? Clearly, there is a connection, a bond. I'm not really lazy. They become my family. Mm -hmm. But there is a part of that where if you hear a certain voice in your head while you're writing, I think it just adds texture and depth to the character. And so I have a lot of muses. I hear Ann Walker's voice. I hear... Dale Dickey's voice. I heard Leslie Jordan's voice so much with characters that I would create. And I would just return to the well. And I love working with new people. But I also love returning to my family. Just like we, we have our chosen family, right? Yes, we do. And they are so important. Yeah. Now, one of the beauties I think of Sorted Lives is your casting. Every single character is perfectly cast. They play their roles beautifully. You mentioned Leslie Jordan, and of course, there's Olivia Newton-John was there, and they're both no longer with us, and I'm sorry, I know they were both friend of yours. Yeah. But it's Olivia Newton-John playing Bitsy May Harling. I never would have thought to cast Sandra D as a trashy singer in a honky-tonk. <laughs> that has bisexual tendencies. <laughs> so yes, it was such a great journey with Olivia because Olivia and I remained very close, but we were close before we shot the movie. Her sister, Rona, who oddly enough, we were talking about deaths. Rona died 10 years ago today. And it was very weird today not to reach out to Olivia about Rona because now Olivia has gone. Anyway, Rona... And I were in an acting class together many, many years ago, became friends. She brought Olivia in 1984 to see my first play. And I was on stage and we met, I met Leslie in that same theater, same year. And he was in really 85. The play opened in 85, four, but they saw it in 85. And she just became so supportive of my work. And that's who she was. She loved her friends and she had a crazy great sense of humor. When I wrote Sorted Live, she came to the play and on my birthday one year, she called me and sang to me and asked me what I was doing lately. And I said, I'm writing the screenplay to Sorted Lives, or I've just written it. And I'm trying to get celebrities, uh, stars attached to a few roles. And she said, why don't you let me play that singer and teach me the accent? And I said, seriously? <laughs> I mean, my superstar friend wants to be in. I said, you know, there's no money in she didn't say it, but I think she really would say was, oh, honey, I don't need money. <laughs> and so she, <laughs> she, she uh, Ann Walker, who played Lavanda, recorded all her lines and she was on tour. She memorized the lines with the accent and she stepped into the role and did the series with me. And I love her for that because she truly did not make much money. <laughs> she just did an incredible job. And I've heard many times that that movie is loosely based on your life growing up in Winters, Texas. And I want to get to that. But before we do, I want to talk about Southern Baptist Sissies, which was another stage play that you did, that you did a movie that was pretty much a filming of the play. It was. It truly was. And it's much different. Yeah. 
Now, it's called a dark comedy. I see it as much more dark than comedy. There's definitely some humor in it. Yeah. But when my husband and I watched it, it was beautiful. We laughed, but it was also difficult. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that I keep hearing that sort of lives is based on your life. Something tells me there's a lot of you in Southern Baptist sissies as well. Yeah. Well, you're right. That was, you know, my dad was a Southern Baptist minister. My mom was the high school drama teacher. And I grew up with those sermons. That's who I heard who I was from those pulpits or who I wasn't. And who I wasn't was the person who could have eternal life because I had this deep, dark secret that I was gay. And it was interesting because after I wrote Sorted Lives, I'd started, before we did the movie, I'd started writing Southern Baptist Sissies. And it was a response to a picture that I had seen in a Time magazine article about the killers of Matthew Shepard. And they were, I guess, in this interview, they were interviewing one of the girlfriends. And behind them, or behind her in this picture, was a picture of Jesus. And I started wondering if those murderers had learned to hate in pews. And I started exploring that. And the first thing I did is I started thinking about the damage that I had. And I'd already written Sorted Lives, so I was pretty much... Uh, my family was already offended. <laughs> so I just, I just started writing and, you know, it was a lot of therapy for me, but the first monologue I wrote was that I have a crush. You know, I knew I was in trouble when I had a crush on Jesus. Well, how could you not those incredible abs? I know that's what Mark says. And so when Mark says those, you know, he had a kind of a swimmer's bill. Yes. And so, but then it, you know, you talk about dark or, or there was comedy there. What is it? Always got to laugh. He had a swimmer's bill. But then it was that turn when he said, you know, I can't be attracted to anybody complete. What's that about? And it went into the, the because I never thought I deserved anyone better. And so all of that, a lot of that I'd, I'd explored in therapy sessions. And suddenly I was writing about it and I thought, wow, I thought I dealt with this, and I really, truly had not. And so Southern Baptist Sissies was very cathartic for me. It was also very scary. I have never opened a play with so much fear as I did Southern Baptist Sissies, just, you know, because lightning's going to strike me. This cannot be a success. And the beautiful thing about Sissies to this day is I get more letters about that play or that movie than anything I've written, even Sorted Lives, because it touches a lot of people who have had religious damage, who have really been hurt in those pews. And the word healing comes up a lot, that it was very healing for them. And so I'm very proud of that work. It is truly my favorite child of my work, body of work and always will be, I think. I don't think I can ever write anything that I am as attached to is that piece. Well, having watched it, it does not surprise me that people are contacting you to tell you that I'm sure some have said it changed their life. It did. I've gotten letters that said it saved their lives. And I don't ever want to sound grand because, you know, my intent to write is, first of all, I really do want to make you laugh. I want to make you think a little bit sometimes. And I just want to entertain you. And if there's anything that's a bonus, then great. And that has truly been a bonus for me. But there is humor in it. And whereas Sorted Lives is seen as a silly comedy, there is a message in there. Yes, there is. And some darkness and pain. You know, we talked about Leslie a little bit. And one of the things that was so genius about Leslie's performances was Leslie was able to, first of all, be completely and 100% authentic, even when it seemed ludicrous. I mean, his performance as Brother Boy is so beautiful and so funny. But then you get to just these tiny moments where, you know, like when Wardell rescues him and you just see the pain in the face. And so he really, and so that was inspirational to me when I wrote and, you know, we collaborated on that role together, me writing and directing him and him just stepping into those heels and being so brilliant. That, you know, and Leslie was 
truly, there are very few people in my life that were closer to me than Leslie Jordan. And so I knew all about the clubs that he frequented when he was using and before he got sober. And I knew all those stories. So when I wrote Southern Baptist Sissies without Peanut and Odette, and then I let him look at it and he goes, oh, honey, everybody's just going to slash their wrist. It's so dark. And he said, you need some humor. And so I went back and I wrote almost like a second play within a play. And then they connected at the end. And then I sent it to him and he said, well, thanks for exposing the rest of my life to the world. (laughs) I I said, will you play it? And he goes, well, of course I will. And, you know, the beautiful thing about his performance in that play is he, I mean, that moment, that last scene with Andrew where he says, don't become me. It is maybe my favorite collaboration with him on anything. And that was all because of him. He literally told me as I was developing the play in rehearsals already, he said, there's something missing. I feel that Peanut has to connect with one of those boys. It would be nice if at the end of his life, when he's lost all hope and he just goes to the bottle, is he could encourage one of the sissies in some way. And I went home and wrote that scene. And I always say the reason Leslie won every theater award available as best supporting actor in this town in in Los Angeles was because of that scene. Not because of the comedy. We all knew he could do the comedy, but that scene is just heartbreaking. And he's so authentic and just beautifully drawn. It's extremely short, yet it ties everything together. I couldn't imagine the film without it. Yeah. Isn't it crazy? It's like one minute and 21 seconds because when Leslie passed away, everybody was asking for that scene. And so I got my friend Emerson Collins to pull it from the movie. And then it went viral everywhere because so many people, you know, were aware of him and not aware of sissies. And his death gave it, you know, even more profile, which I'd rather have him than that. But Well, I want to say I've worked in the hospitality industry, mainly the hotel industry for decades. And... Having seen a lot of celebrities, I've never been starstruck at all. Just, it's like, oh, of course I want to take a look, but that's usually been about it. And then, of course, once I moved to LA and, you know, it's a regular thing, it's been very rare, but there's two that really made me step back. One was Shamar Moore, but that's only because I wanted to jump his bones. <laughs> and the other, you mentioned Le- Leslie being sober. I actually used to see Leslie quite a bit at meetings and it took everything I had to respect that and know it is not the place because I so wanted to thank him for his work. Mm. And I hear that he's going to be honored with a star in Palm Springs. Yes. You know, I don't know if you saw on Instagram when I have a star in Palm Springs that happened, I think, in 2006 after the big craziness of Sorted Lives. And then we were on tour there with three of my plays at the Annenberg. But about a year before Leslie passed away, he was in Palm Springs and he's like, on my star with a glass of tea. And he's going, I don't know why Dale Shores has a star and I don't have a star. And then he just poured the tea over my star and he goes, oops, anybody got a jackhammer? (laughs) And so when he passed away a few weeks later, I posted that and said, okay, y'all, it's time for Leslie to have a star. And the Chamber of Commerce and Pop Springs reached out to me. They said, sponsor it, you know, just nominate him. And I did. And they said they had never had a more positive response to someone getting a star than Leslie. So Leslie will have left this plane October the 24th. And he actually got sober on October 20th. I mean, he got sober before just he on October. He got sober October 20th. But then he had to go to jail (laughs) because he got sober. What wasn't the first time. But that's when he got sober. And because he called me on my birthday and wished me a happy birthday from jail. So I can always remember I was 40 years old. He would have been sober, you know, 23 years. No, tw- no, I'm 20, I'm 65, it's, uh, 25 years. So anyway, his star is going to be unveiled October the 20th in Palm Springs and right behind the Rowan in that park. And there'll be a nice ceremony that I'm hosting on October the 20th. Well, I think I may take the 90 minute drive and be there. 
Please do. Oh, I would love come, that. Come, come. It's going to be a great ceremony. We're going to have a lot of fun people. Maya Bialik is coming to speak and uh, some of the sorted folks. So there'll be some music. It'll be a wonderful celebration of, of Leslie. And we're going to come back to Leslie and, and some of the other productions. Uh, before we shift gears, I do want to tell a listener, a lot of you may only know Leslie as Beverly Leslie on Will and Grace, and he was hysterical. But if you haven't seen Sorted Lives or even Southern Baptist Sissies, you ain't seen nothing yet. So check them out. Yeah. And they're all on, just Google that people say, where are they? I go, I have this friend named Google. And you just go and you just put you, put Southern Baptist Sissies, put Leslie Jordan, Del Shores, and you will get all our work together because they're all out there. They're on Prime, they're on Hulu, and they're available. Do yourself a favor right now. It's quick, easy, and you won't miss one second of the show. Whether you're on the phone or on the computer, look at the app where you're hearing me now and find the button that says follow or subscribe and click it. Now you'll be notified when a new episode publishes and you won't miss a single one. Well, the reason I want to shift gears real quick is I want to make sure that we talk about the Dell Shores Foundation. Thank you. Which I know you're very proud of. Yes. And uh, just share with us, what is the foundation? Why did you decide to start it? Well, honestly, when my friend Stuart Bell came to me and he had watched me mentor our good friend, Matt Hayes, who works with me. He's one of my associates on my little tiny team. Everybody goes, oh, your team. I go, yeah, my <laughs> team is yeah, three people, Emerson Collins and Matt Hayes and me. That's our team. But Matt wanted to write a short film and he wrote this beautiful, long short film called Cognitive. And I helped him get it to shooting form. I gave him notes on it. And then he cast me in it as this horrible homophobic pastor. And I mentored him along the way of directing it. And it won so many film festivals. It was so beautifully drawn. And so Stuart, my friend Stuart Bell, had been a part of helping financially. And he said, why don't we start a foundation where you do this for a lot of people. And I said, Oh my God, I'm about to, you know, get Medicare. I don't want to do something else this big. And then I started thinking about it. And I started talking to Emerson and we were all at the same table and we started, we just figured a way to do it in a rather creative way where we have a contest every year. And there are three categories. There's short film, there's screenplay, and there's play. And our goal is to help facilitate LGBTQ storytellers, Southern storytellers, get their projects made where they don't just go in a drawer. They don't just go, I wrote this screenplay when I was 20 years old. I didn't pursue it because so many people don't know how to get momentum with their work. And I wish that I had had a little more help early on, but I did have some help. And I also had, I was also in LA and mm -hmm. these folks are all in the South. They have stayed there. They fought the fight there. And there's so many beautiful stories. We just had our second search. We're about to announce on June the 1st. You can go to DelShoresFoundation.org. You can donate and help storytellers tell their stories that way because we're a tiny organization. doesn't take us much to make this happen. But last year's winner, I'm directing his play here in Los Angeles. So he's getting his world premiere here, Jigs Burgess. We flew out the screenplay winners, Monet and Soraya, and they met with Ryan Murphy's company, Greg Berlanti's company, A24 agencies, and we just give them opportunity to get to the next place in their career. So that's what we're doing, and I'm very proud of it. I'm just so happy with it was this little vision, and we were able to execute it. And we're just about to announce our second year winners. And the link is in the show notes. And I do think you should support it because not only is Dell developing these people, they're going to be the ones that entertain us. Mm -hmm. So there's something in it for all of us. Thank you for mentioning it because it is one of my true passions now is to having seen the results 
And I got to tell you, Brad, when we had our writers conference, because what we do is all the winners and all of the, the finalists get to come to a southern city. Last year, it was Dallas. And we congregate, we fly them in, you know, we put them up in a hotel. So they have a weekend of just creative people helping them know what else to do. Because you can write and then you go, what, what do I do with it? You know, and we have playwrights. And I had Jason Williams, who co-wrote Greater Tuna. And, you know, that for me, I'm such a fangirl of that <laughs> franchise. And for me to sit and interview Jason Williams was just an amazing adventure for me. But that's the kind of people we are bringing in. And Jason's now on our honorary board. And the foundation actually is sponsoring the star out in Palm Springs for Leslie because it raises profile because there was no better Southern storyteller than Leslie Jordan. So, you know, he will always be our honorary co-chair of the foundation. So anyway, we're really proud of that work. And yes, and if you are a Southern storyteller, keep up with us on the website and submit your short film or your play or your screenplay. You never know. You've had your series of difficult times. Your coming out experience is not the way you would have preferred. You also had some challenges after Sorted Lives, the series was canceled. Yet through it all, you've had incredible success. How do you define happiness? Well, <laughs> I think happiness comes and goes <laughs> and, and it depends on the day. I think that when you're in a really good place in your life, that it's so helpful and there have been many of those in my lives and, and our lives are hills and valleys. And so, yes, you know, 2008, nine was not so you, the series comes out. It's the number one show ever on logo until RuPaul's Drag Race came. And we weren't treated very nicely, you know, not by logo, but our producer was stealing money. And, you know, and we suddenly our success was not rewarded. I lost my home during that time. But then you go back. Just a little before that, and I was on Queer as Folk for three years. And I was getting all that TV money, and I was happy, and I was, you know, in love, or thought I was. And then the divorce happens, and then, you know, there's another downtime. And, but then your kids graduate from college, and you go, wow, you know, I raised some amazing daughters. So I feel good right now, and that's what matters. Today, I'm very happy. I'm in a relationship now for the first time in a long, long time. And he's a beautiful man. And, and I don't mean just physically, he is a beautiful human. And he's age appropriate. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, we all learn from the past. <laughs> and hopefully I have learned. I also think, Brad, I don't know about you, but I mean, we look at the positives in our lives. And sometimes we look at the negatives too. And sometimes the negatives create a positive in a weird way. And I have to say that Leslie's death, especially, it made me like look at other things. And I thought, you know, well, that's not that important to be upset over this, fill in the blank. That's really not important at all. So I feel like that happiness sometimes comes, besides in waves, mm -hmm. it comes with experience. It's like you go, okay. Why did mm -hmm. I fret this bullshit? Why did I worry about it? It's just stupid. Stupid. You think about, oh my God, the time I went off on that poor lighting designer. Why? You know, so I, I'm taking more breaths these days. <laughs> and I think that helps with happiness. I agree with you 100%. I'm getting asked and therefore been doing a lot of inspirational podcasts because my past has not been the stuff dreams are made of. And they want me to share my story because I see it all today as an adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't see it that way at the time, but it's all a part of who I am today. It's so interesting. I keep going back to him and I told you, I don't want to talk as much about Maybe the healing has started because I'm feeling like it's okay to talk about Leslie today. I, did, I usually, one of the reasons I didn't want to talk so much about him is because it really just makes me so sad and it's reliving the grief again. But on that subject that you just said, because you just said that you saw him in recovery rooms and after my second divorce, Leslie came to me and he, he said, I want to take you to an Al-Anon meeting. 
And I said, oh, Leslie, I don't want to go. I just don't want to go. I've been to those Al-Anon meetings. It's just like listening to one, these pitiful people tell these stories. And he said, you are one of those pitiful people. And I, 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 I said, oh, OK, OK. So he took me to this Al-Anon meeting and it was over there on Robertson, right across from there's another little house that they have a lot of um, AA meetings. But this was in, across the street. And I remember that they're called the log cabin. Yeah, the, it's a cro- right across from the log cabin is where I would go to my Al-Anon meetings. And he's he he went with me at first. And there was the first time I was there, there was this woman this beautiful African-American speaker with this woman who who said, you know, how many newcomers are here today? And, you know, I raised my hand and she said, I want to just talk to you for a second, all of you. She said, I know that probably you're here today because of some darkness in your life or your perception of darkness. But one day you're going to look back at this period and you're going to see that that's when a ray of light entered. And I didn't leave with too much more than that that day. But man, as I look back at that, at what she said was so brilliant and so simple because that needed to happen in my life. That divorce needed, that needed to go, you know, it was time to weed your garden sometimes. And I don't want to get all (laughs) crazy on you here. But in that... I look back and I thought, man, that was new beginnings for me. And not in a negative way. That was new beginnings in a positive way. My work got better. My work ethic got better. The distraction wasn't there. I wasn't completely, you know, I I learned how to not be such a fucking codependent, you know. (laughs) You know, there is the line in Southern Baptist history. I'm, I'm so fucking codependent when I die somebody else's life is going to flash before my eyes <laughs> so <laughs> I love that line yeah as do I <laughs> so so anyway that's that's my little sermonette today I'm going to actually make you do another sermon because there's something I, I want to know you and I are very similar in the sense that we were both married I had a daughter I was in my mid-30s when I came out I'm not sure what age you were that's exactly same 35. Okay, so we were the exact same age, but our experiences were different. I chose to come out where you were exposed, and that was a difficult time for you. As you said, your father was a Southern Baptist minister. Mm -hmm. TJ is, there are two especially tragic characters in Southern Baptist sissies. TJ is one, and he broke my heart. He suppresses who he is, marries, has children, and stays a good church-going man. I was feeling more than anyone else. I was connecting TJ with you. Well, I have often said that I'm all of them. They're all me. There's all a piece of me and all of them. But I guess, yes, that part of TJ's life up until I was 35. And then there was a, a you know, there was exposure. There was like, okay, I got busted having a fling. And uh, it was the first time that I had had a fling, but even though I'd had many of these thoughts and many of these desires, but then I made the choice. This, and I cannot continue to live a lie. And unlike TJ, TJ had to continue to live a lie. He couldn't come out of it. And you think about the circumstances of his life, the military dad, you know, he got so far into it and he did not want to be gay. And that's where I was at one time. And then I became Mark. You know, I was Mark. I was the storyteller. Mark is much more me in the terms of like my mother. Mark's mother was so my mother where she just had a reason for everything. I love that scene where he's talking about, well, that's why we have foreign missionaries so that everybody, you know, she just has an answer. (laughs) Uh, and, And certainly my questioning about the church came out of my love for the Jewish community and not being gay. And that's where Mark started first questioning when his teacher was gay. And so, and then there's a lot, Benny, I used to have these horrible nightmares about the rapture. I would hear a loud noise and I would bolt out of bed thinking that, you know, Jesus was going to be bursting through the clouds 
And after that play opened, that all went away. And then there was a time in my life where I would go to that church like Andrew and pray, please make it go away. Please make it go away. If you ask anything, you know, God can do it. That's what we were taught. So they're all a little bit of me, but good observation, my friend. I was hesitant to ask that because as a writer myself, people ask, how do you come up with these characters? Which is hard to answer. I'm like, well, it's part of the little old lady I saw sitting in the corner of Starbucks and part of that man I talked with on the bench. And yet they're always a part of me too. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't surprising for me to hear you say, yes, I am TJ. And yes, I am Mark, because they reflect two different parts of your life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your characters can be considered stereotypes, and I'm sure you hear that. But I say stereotypes frequently exist for a reason. Maybe they're exaggerated, but the people in your plays and your movies, how real are they to you? I'm going to just exit frame just for a second to get one of my playbooks, because I want to read something to you that addresses this. It's in all of my plays. This is uh, Sorted Lives. And it says, author's note, right there at the bottom. These people are real. Don't play them as cartoons, please. That's it. (laughs) And they were all very real to me. And, you know, one of my favorite reviews ever of Leslie's performance as Brother Boy was he approaches the brim without spilling over. And when someone says these people don't exist, I go, I've never been down to a small town in Texas because I get much more, you know, it's mainly critics who have said that, but I get much more of people who go, oh my God, I know Juanita. She is down at the bar. I know her. Mm-hmm. I, my mother is Latrell. I have an Aunt Sissy. Uh, my, I have an Aunt Lavanda, you know, so... It's okay, though. You know, whatever people want to say, that's okay. It's like when I look at Rotten Tomatoes and I see that the critics are 30, only 32% of the critics gave Sorted Lives the movie positive reviews, but 87% of the people gave it a positive review. So I'm going, I'll take that. No surprise to me whatsoever. Yeah. Well, in Sorted Wedding, it's even that they finally got good reviews. It's like up to like 80 something with the critics, but the audience, 95 percent. So I will take the audience over the critics any day. I couldn't agree with you more. And there is a funny thing about stereotypes. In my first novel, there's a Latino character who lives in MacArthur Park, which used to be an upscale neighborhood and today is a poor immigrant community. Yeah. And I had a friend read it and he said, wow. With Ernesto, you captured my family. Mm. Yet I got a review complaining that I need to watch it with the Latino stereotypes. Yeah, right. Didn't someone leave a cake out in the rain in MacArthur's (laughs) part? It's funny you mentioned that. I do describe in the novel the change from MacArthur Park from beautiful to what it is today. And I have a line Someone left a cake out in the rain and it melted all over the place. <laughs> it's just <laughs> messed it up. It's, oh, goodness. Yeah, right after I got sober, I was taking a shortcut through MacArthur Park to get to the subway. And I called my sponsor. I said, I'm freaking out. I'm in, I'm in MacArthur Park. He said, get the hell out of there right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do not put yourself in that situation. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Absolutely not. I need to hear something, and I believe the listener does too. As we discussed earlier, you had your share of challenges. You had your divorce, and yet you persisted. You had the troubles after your TV series was canceled, leading to your home being foreclosed on, and yet you bounced back. I guess I can't say how much you bounced back, but you're here. It's not a bad place I'm living in. (laughs) I'm okay. I'm okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Good. Good. But we know the political climate going right now. And listen, today that the day that we're recording this is the day that Ron D. Satan has announced he's running for presidency, which is no surprise to anyone. And I don't want to go into the rest of the political climate because we all know what it is. But I read your Twitter posts and boy, are you angry, (laughs) as many of us are. Yet you continue to write and you've started, actually, especially you started your foundation. So something is keeping you going. There has to be hope or you would just stop. 
Well, it's not just the hope. It's that I can I can actually what you're saying. I love what you're saying, because it's not just my Twitter feed. It still is reflected in my work, whether I stand on stage with a mic or whatever. I am able. It's the one thing we just had this sort of little tri-city fundraising. We went to Atlanta, Birmingham and Nashville. And I said this, I said, art Mm -hmm. changes minds. It changes hearts and minds. And it's the one way, if I can do it with humor, if I can just slip a little humor, think about sorted lives. Think about, okay, yes, it is a gay movie, but boy, did it go wider than that because people identified with the humor and the characters. And so if you can do that, and I don't know how not to continue this voice that I have and these, you know, these opinions, as you see on Twitter, I have to, I am required to. It's my obligation. And Carrie Lake blocked me yesterday on Twitter. So I had a really good day. I saw that and it made me laugh. Uh, Yet I hate it when people feel they must one up someone. But I unfortunately was after Donald Trump was banned. But I said something and I was blocked by Eric Trump. Oh, I've never gotten blocked by a Trump. I would love that. I wear it as a badge of honor. Oh, my God. I have so many. I mean, Scott (laughs) Bayo blocked me. Travis Tripp blocked me. I have a whole list of them. Corey Lewandowski blocked me. Piers Brosnan, Piers Morgan blocked me. Kirstie Alley, rest her. She blocked me before her death. Well, having seen your your posts, none of that surprises me. And good on you. (laughs) Good on you. So uh, the last thing I want to ask before I say goodbye is what is an insult that you have received that you're proud of? (laughs) I guess one of my favorite things that was so clever that someone did, and I have no idea what it was that they were mad at me about because there could be, (laughs) there's a plethora of things that I have said and someone created a meme and put it up on Facebook that said Del Shores, asshole of the year. <laughs> and I was just so proud of that because I was thinking, man, there's so many people who could have, you, know, you think about, who, who could have been more of an asshole than me, but I won. In this man's eye, I won asshole of the year. So I think that, that he meant that as an insult. I was so proud. <laughs> so out of all the assholes and you're the top, you should have that the wallpaper on your desktop. So I should, I had it in one of my shows at one point where one of my comic friends was opening for me. And in the middle of the show, he just interrupted my set and he goes, Dell, <laughs> we have good news. <laughs> you have just been awarded asshole of the year. <laughs> and so I'd show the beam. <laughs> Well, Dell, I'm going to have the link to your website, certainly going to have the link to the foundation and uh, listener, if you want to learn more about Dell, that you can also find it on my website and the other links there as well. So Dell, again, it has been an honor. I'm so thrilled that you've been my guest today. How much fun was this? I really enjoyed this. I have a list every day of things to do. I still have like three or four things. But I, thought, I am so happy to take a break in the middle of my day and go. I used to do a daily list. Now I do three day lists. So I can just give myself a little time to procrastinate. There you go. That's smart. So, And I'm glad to hear I was a break in your day. You are a wonderful break. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on most social media. Got to keep up with friends and family, you know. But where you'll find me hanging out most is Instagram. Sure, I post about this podcast sometimes. But who wants to follow an account that's all commercials, right? I have more fun sharing posts or reels with good thoughts, opinions, humor, or on a good day, all of the above. To find me on Instagram, search for at thebradshreve. Or you can just make your life easy and click the link there in the show notes. See you on Instagram.